Let's say the players in your D&D game are working for a military faction, they're trying to take over a city, and the army has sent your party ahead of them to go into the city and try to get it to surrender before the city even gets there. And the way that your players decide to do this is to assassinate the leader of this city and instill someone more sympathetic to their cause who will open the gates wide. Well, this is indeed exactly the situation that my players found themselves in, and this is how I ran that assassination attempt. Hey everybody, it's Nick. Welcome to the video here. This is just a channel where I usually do campaign diaries and I sort of talk about uh, lessons, stories, and examples from my game. Things that you can learn from, successes I had, and maybe uh, avoid repeating the mistakes that I made. I wanted to talk today about assassinations. Assassinations in D&D is a really interesting subject. It's something that's not really covered in the rules, but then again, most things aren't covered in the rules. The rules are just sort of a list of a framework of ideas, a way to do things, and how you accomplish them is up to you. So assassination is this interesting category of something where, you know, you feel like in with combat stats that you have to live up to all the combat expectations of something your hit points and armor class and things like that and how could you assassinate somebody who has 90 hit points you have to do 90 hit points of damage in a single instant to them right I don't think so. I think you can do a lot with assassination especially outside the context of combat because remember Hit points in D&D, &D. this is not a novel idea by the way, this is in the rules. Hit points in D&D, &D, at least in 5th edition, and as far as I'm aware, every edition, are an abstraction. They are a measure of your stamina, agility, luck, and ability to avoid a fatal blow. They are not how many times can you be stabbed with a sword or shot with an arrow before you will fall unconscious. Now, knowing that, we know that if somebody is standing, tied up, not resisting, not attempting to hold back, somebody else has an executioner's axe and they chop their head off, there are no rolls made. There is no damage dealt, you just die. You swing the axe, the head comes clean off. You don't roll a d12 for a great axe and then add your strength modifier because that's how much damage you take and just keep hacking and hacking until the head comes off. No. That person just dies. And I think assassination can be a similar thing. You find a sleeping target, you creep up to them, and then you slit their throat. They just die. A guard is on watch, not paying attention. You sneak up behind them, grab them from behind, slit their throat. They just die. And I mentioned that to my players, and that was the impetus for this assassination attempt. They got it in their head that how they were going to uh, solve their problem with the city was assassinate the governor, and then work with another corporation, an entity, the Huthan Mining family, uh, to instill a governor more sympathetic to their mutual cause. So this was my player's plan. They had a rogue who had some poison on a blade and his plan was to get spider climb cast on himself and then drink a potion of invisibility that he had, climb up the walls of a castle and on the wall was the governor who was gonna be giving a public speech. Everyone in the town hall was uh, gathered, uh, the town square, sorry, everyone in the town square was gathered and the governor was gonna be giving a speech, an announcement to the people, letting them know something. There was gonna be some guards up there, the governor's family were up there, but the player was gonna be invisible, spider climb up the wall, grab a hold of the governor, governor, slit her throat, and escape. And so how I ran it was he would need to he'd walk up the, the wall just fine. Um, getting past everyone, there's a crowd, sneaking through there, not a problem, he's invisible, there's a loud crowd, everything is pretty easy at this point. Walks up the wall, no checks need to be made, he has spider climb. The problem would come when he tries to lean up over the battlements because that's when he could scuff his foot on something. He'd be close enough that people could hear him. And so what I did is I said, okay, you have advantage because you're invisible, so roll a stealth check, and whatever you get is gonna be the DC that anybody else has to overcome to try to notice you. And it is reasonable to roll here because you know, you're know you invisible, but that doesn't make you undetectable. You could still scuff your foot on the wall coming over. It's harder to judge distances when you're invisible, right? You can't see your own body to make adjustments as you move and climb and things. So this is unusual sort of positioning for you. You could still awkwardly misstep things like that. And so he was explaining why I would ask for a stealth roll from a player who is invisible, a new player, try and get them uh, accustomed with how I would do things. And then I told him, okay, the governor is speaking. She's standing, she's moving a little bit, she's addressing the crowd. You're going to have to 
grab hold of her so that you can slit her throat. And so this is going to be an athletics check contested by the governor's athletics or acrobatics check. And I think I gave the player advantage as well because they were invisible and the governor wouldn't be suspecting it. Um, and if they succeeded in this contest, I would have allowed them to just grab, slice their throat, and then escape. And as you can tell by my use of verbs and tenses, they did not succeed. Uh, the rogue had a pretty low athletics, didn't grab hold of the governor, who was a pretty powerful general, had a pretty high athletics. And so um, the, this player failed in their attempt to grapple, and what happened was a little bit of a contested back and forth. The governor obviously knows somebody is grabbing at her. Um, the governor grabs back, and, and what the governor does is just try to push, just try to push this person away backwards over the wall. If the governor succeeds this role, the player, uh, the character Varys, falls backwards off of the battlements and lands 80 feet below. This is going to be a bad thing for them. Uh, they contest roll, and I think they tied, so things stayed status quo exactly where they were. Um, and at this point, now the governor yells, Assassin! Guards! Guards! Um, and then I give everyone basically one more turn, one more action before these guards who are on top of the battlements with the governor get to her, grab her, pull her away to somewhere safe, and the players will have to rethink their entire plan. Uh, once again, my player makes an attack roll and tries to uh, use the poison dagger. So like, I know I'm only going to do a d4 of damage, but maybe I'll get the poison and that'll do something and uh, that'll help out. Rolls very badly. Uh, if if the player Charlie, uh, playing Varys, had rolled a lot better, this would have been a really smooth, clean encounter. But unfortunately, uh, sometimes the dice are against you. And so misses with that attack. And one of the players standing in the crowd, one of the other party members, decides to do something a little creative. They're two warlocks. They both have the grasp of Hadar invocation. And so they cast Eldritch Blast on the governor, attempting to pull her off the battlements. They get four attack rolls, but I say because of the angle and because of everything that's happening up there, the governor has three quarters cover, so it's gonna be really difficult. She's wearing full plate armor and has three quarters cover. It's a hard Eldritch Blast to land, and out of the four attack rolls, because Eldritch Blast has two um, you know, different beams at this level, where the players are fifth level at this point, though at the end of the session they hit sixth level, that's cool. Uh, they were fifth level though, and there were two attack rolls made uh, by each player, only one of whom hit. However, that's all you needed. And so they yoink the governor off the battlements, and I had Varys, who was standing right in front of the governor, make a deck save. It's a deck save for a rogue to avoid being knocked off by the governor as she goes flying past him. Uh, he rolled like a four, and then a, you know, a four plus whatever. Not enough to succeed, and so both Varys and the governor's mage go off the battlements and land 80 feet below in the crowd. Now, obviously, at this point, things have gone very differently than the players plan. Uh, the crowd is panicking and running all around, so the players just sort of switch into, all right, I guess this is combat mode. And the players all run up and attack the governor while she's down, uh, attempting to do as much damage as possible before uh, guards can come and rescue her. And eventually, uh, this... this character, the governor, is taking a lot of damage. She must be a kind of a high-level character, in which she is. Um, she gets up, runs away, survives opportunity attacks, and just before she gets to reinforcements, the monk, Terrace, rushes over with his crazy movement speed, grabs her from behind, and deals the killing blow to her. So the governor dies, and the players have to scatter as quick as possible. Oh yeah, one last quick detail. The players, the, I think one of the warlocks, cast Shatter on her body, and Shatter destroys non-magical objects, and once you are a corpse, you're technically an object. And so basically the governor's body explodes into a red mushy goo, to which one of the characters says, Splash Zone. Which was just a terrifying, uh, horrible situation. I made sure to really play up their murder of this governor. I wanted the players to know that what they did was not 
like a good guy thing to do. I mean, obviously you have your justification for it, but assassination pretty much on any level uh, outside of a dictatorial tyrant who is genocidal maniac type thing, uh, I would consider a pretty evil action, uh, regardless of where you stand on somebody's political views. If you were to assassinate uh, pretty much any current world leader, that would be an evil action to take. And so uh, I wanted to play up that a little bit, that gore factor and the... Uh, uh, uncomfortable situation as the players are all fleeing. Uh, they managed to get back to the safe house and things sort of unwound from there. So back at the safe house, the players sort of decompressed a little bit. I expressed to some of the cleric players that their gods didn't withdraw from them. They were still present, they were still there, but they had that overwhelming sense of disappointment. You know, like your parents get sometimes, you wish they would be angry, but they weren't. They were just disappointed. And so that really got some of the some of the clerics there as well. Uh, the players were sort of talking about, okay, their options, what do we do now? We succeeded, but sort of an at what cost thing. And their handler gave them a scroll. Uh, this scroll was dropped off, delivered here to the safe house where they were hanging out. And I handed the players a physical, actual scroll, a piece of paper here with a note on it. And uh, I like doing handouts. I like if it's possible to do a, a physical handout, a, a prop, if you will, for players. And I usually don't uh, tea stain my props, uh, my like letters and things like that. But uh, this was the first prop that a lot of my new players had ever seen in any D&D game before. And I was like, yeah, sure, let's do some tea staining. So I actually asked my wife to drink some tea because... I know it's a sin, but I don't really drink tea, so uh, I asked her to drink some tea so I could steal a bit of it and stain this letter. And uh, I will just read it for you here, as I don't have it memorized. You did your job, now trust us to do ours. As a courtesy, we are telling you to leave the city. We have shared what we know about you and your actions in order to secure our mutual goals. The guards may already know your faces, you will be wanted, and no place in the city will be safe. We will not protect you. If you can, leave the city and lay low until Bolero is under new management. We will never have contact again. So, that was obviously a letter from the Huthan Mining family, the organization that the players were working with. And in order to get what they wanted, the Mining family gave up who the assassins were. And so, sort of a, hey, if you step down, flee with your family, you won't get assassination attempts, governor, against you anymore, and we will catch whoever the assassins are. And so, the players then fled the city as a result of that. They had a conversation in the middle of that. Do we want to leave and just trust that this mining family is going to do what they said they were going to do? Or do we stick around, lay low, avoid notice, and maybe, hopefully... Uh, we can check back in, and what happens if they don't fulfill their end of the bargain? I guess we got to start over, right? The players, though, decided this was a pretty risky option, especially because they knew they had sort of a side goal. Sorel had been feeling a calling towards the mountains that were just north of this city, and uh, as part of his patron warlock situation, and so they were like, you know what, okay, let's go with Sorel to the mountains, see what's up there, and then hopefully we can get back to the city before Ares is here. We can sneak into the city, and we can see what the situation is, and maybe we can solve that problem if if it comes up. So that was the player's plan, and that's what they did. So I described they travel for a few days, they climb some mountains, it's bitter cold up here, and there is uh, lots of snow, it takes them several days as they're traveling, and then eventually they find what they're looking for. Sorel sees down in the distance uh, a black obelisk standing by itself in the middle of a clearing in the mountains. And as they approach it, they let him go forward by himself to sort of like, hey, this is your thing, you go interact with that, we'll hang back 50, 60 feet. Well, as he's on his way to it, a random encounter happens. It's not a random encounter. I don't really do random encounters like rolling for it. I sort of plan encounters, but I have random in the world kind of encounters that just happens upon you. There were some yetis. I thought the yetis are cool, and if we don't have a combat here, there probably won't be much combat this, uh, this session, so eh, let's do a combat. And this is when I learned that not all online CR uh, combat 
builder calculators are built the same. I don't really use encounter builders to make sure that a fight is exactly medium or hard or deadly or less than deadly or whatever because I found in my experience they're terribly uh, loose and generic and they're a ballpark at best kind of a feature. It goes entirely out the window if you roll for stats, give out magic items, have more than four players in the party, um, use feats, things like that, and I do pretty much all of those things and so I have found that it is a loose approximation but I do like to sort of get in the ballpark of okay I want to have like an abominable Yeti that's cool and then a few regular Yetis how many regular Yetis is it two is it four is it three I don't know and so just to get a ballpark I usually use an encounter builder to give me an idea and I can do live leveling in the middle of an encounter if need be so tweak the DCs on things, lower the damage dice, things like that, lower hit points. But uh, oftentimes I, that's what I use them for and one of, I had switched to a different encounter builder, a friend of mine recommended it and it has a lot of useful features that I am using, but the encounter builder portion of it I think is calculating things incorrectly or at least very differently than Cobalt Fight Club, which is what I typically use and I do recommend. Uh, I think the new one I was using, which I'm not gonna mention so you don't have to use it as well, uh, was incorrectly calculating the adjusted difficulty for how many combatants there were. It was making the fight easier the more combatants there were instead of harder. And so that led to a player dying again because I've been using the wrong combat builder, encounter builder thing, and it was making fights way more difficult than I had intended. And so Sorel actually, because he had gone forward by himself and because the fight was Pretty darn hard. All The only thing I had made was I had changed the Abominable Yeti did not have its uh, breath attack. Um, I just removed that completely from it and figured, okay, that'll knock it down to like a CR7-ish and it'll probably be fine. Um, and so, yeah, so Sorel dies in that combat. The players kept getting paralyzed by the chilling gaze or whatever of the yetis. And that led to a, a really tough situation. If you're failing your con saves against that, you're going to be paralyzed. And if you're paralyzed, you can't do anything at all. And attacks against you are crits if they hit from melee. And so it was a really tough fight. Sorel ended up dying. They did manage to resurrect him. There was a whole, a whole thing there. So it's it's not that big a deal. I'm, I'm more okay with players going down and being threatened lethally this campaign because we have two whole clerics. So actually permanently killing players is going to be a very difficult for me, which is fine. That's not my goal or intention or anything like that. I just like to have the threat of death on the table if at all possible with the follow through occasionally. So Sorel arrives at this obelisk and in his visions it had a symbol carved on it and glowing. This obelisk was empty and so he touches it, and where he touched it, it starts to glow, the same color he's seen in his visions. And so he, with his finger, inscribes the rune on it, and it lights up and stays lit. And then his sword, his summoned sword that was a gift to him from his patron, disappears. And then a few moments later, it reappears in his hand, but the hilt is different. It's wooden now, and it's got carvings of ravens flying on it, and it's perfectly fitted to his grip. And I told him that your hilt is now a rod of the Pact Keeper, so you can use your sword as a spellcasting focus, and your spells and save DCs are a little more, a little higher. And also that in the pommel, there's the picture of the raven that he's used to, but there are now seven stars surrounding it. Three of the stars are lit up and glowing the same color as the rune he inscribed. And so he gets the sense that like, okay, this was somehow number three, and there are four more of this thing that I have to do. Maybe there's somebody else who is lighting them? Because I don't remember lighting these beacons or inscribing these runes on uh, these obelisks. So maybe someone else is helping or also doing this? We'll see. I then gave Sorella a vision where the next obelisk would be, where he could find it. Um, off to the east in the middle of a desert, there was black sand in the middle of the black sand. He will find his next obelisk. And so he's like, okay, good to know. File that away. 
And uh, then the players make their way back to the city to try to figure out, okay, make sure that we're there when Ares gets there and make sure the city gates are flung open and we succeed. So they travel back relatively uneventfully. They get to a spot in the mountains where they can see the city below them and they see that Ares has already arrived at the city. He got there sooner than they had anticipated, but luckily, the gates had been thrown open and Ares and his army were walking freely through the city, had taken it over, no problem, no battle. Great news, they succeeded in their first mission for Emperor Ares and the military of Ocran. Congratulations, players. That is until, as they're watching, there are several explosions that ring out through the city. Clouds of debris and smoke rise. They can hear screams of injured uh, rising from the city. They rush down as quick as they can, and they talk to somebody to figure out, what happened? What happened here? It turns out that traps had been left, and barrels and barrels of this new substance, this black sand material that if you light a fire to it explodes, had been left in key strategic places all throughout the city. And they went off in unison and killed hundreds of Goliath soldiers and injured at least twice as many more. And so it was a devastating blow to the invading force. Um, this is a result of another person's antics. So a few videos ago, I had talked about how I was going to have one of my friends who was a former player running a faction in this campaign. Well, this is his first action. He is running an adventurer's guild that is from Krell and is trying to defend Krell from the invading force. And one of the things that he did was he convinced the governor to get most of the civilians out of the city, evacuate Bolero and have only the smallest combat force remain. And if they were overrun, leave behind these traps of black powder, which the nation of Krell was the first to invent canonically here in my setting, and it was in this city. So this is the birthplace of black powder, gunpowder, in my setting. And it is a relatively secret technology still, very new. Only the nation of Krell has it so far. However, now the nation of Ocran has it, and that's a game changer to some degree. Uh, sieging is gonna be very different now that they have this. And so uh, this was his sort of plan, his master stroke, and so it's been very interesting interacting with my friend Chris and him role-playing the organization, the Titan Guard Guild, that he helped found as a player several years ago in a different campaign of mine. Uh, it was a really cool experience, and back and forth with him, trying to figure out what his resources are, what his options are, and this was a strike of retribution against the players. So the players go through the city, and they find their handler, Zelix, the mind flayer, and they talk through the situation and they figure out what happened and then Zelik says okay you got a little bit of downtime now you can take a little bit but the, your next assignment is to go we uncovered uh, some secret tomes as we were lo looking through the city and we found mention of a powerful artifact called the Maw of Life and Death and its resting place as far as we can tell is this temple or dungeon or crypt somewhere um, off in uh, several you know, hundred miles away and we're going to ask you to go and recover it. So take a little bit of time, rest, recuperate, and then go and recover this artifact. It might be very useful for our in like uh, upcoming campaign as we are trying to take over the world basically. So that is where we left things. We gave the players some time to plan and prepare for their next session. Uh, there is a lot of things that I could tell you about the Maw of Life and Death. I think it has featured at least as a minor role in all of my D&D campaigns so far. Um, very interesting item. I have lots of cool lore and things like that about it, but the players don't know any of that, so I will wait to tell you until next week. They will find out a significant amount more about it, and then I'll tell you then. So it's already been a pretty long video. We don't need to bog it down more with my discussion of an artifact. Anyways, uh, that is my session. That is what happened. That is how I would run an assassination attempt in D&D. &D. I hope there were interesting or useful lessons in there, or at the very least, a fun story to follow along with. 
I appreciate everybody who is watching and uh, commenting, engaging with the content. Uh, this is really fun making these videos and I like uh, answering questions that people have for my campaign, taking ideas that I've gotten in the comments and stealing them for my campaign. So I appreciate all the help, all the feedback, all the engagement that you folks are giving. Uh, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Look at this. Looks like I'm just blending into the wall here, right? Just, just a head floating, like I'm on a green screen, wearing a green shirt. That's a terrible choice. Definitely not changing my shirt. Oh well, show goes on.